Introduction to Fluids A fluid by definition is any substance that's able to flow. So both liquids as well as gases are defined as fluids. There is a unique difference between a liquid and a gas. Liquids, they're not easily compressible. Meanwhile, gases, they're very easily compressible. Imagine you take one of those uh, disposable water bottles and you cap it up, but it's empty. And you try squishing it. It's rather easy when there's just gas inside. However, if you fill it up to the brim and then you cap it off and try squishing it again, it's really difficult. All right, so that's one of the unique differences between a liquid fluid versus a gas fluid. And that is a key important idea, especially in vehicles. For example, in the brake line in your vehicle, it's always filled up with oil. And it's because oil is a liquid and it's very difficult to compress. So it's able to transfer all the force from the master cylinder uh, at the front end of, the, of your car uh, to all the calipers in your brakes. If it was filled up with gas, on the other hand, uh, you'll notice that not all the mechanical work would be transferred uh, to all the brakes. Um, and that's when uh, your brake will feel rather squishy and you'll notice you'll have a tougher time uh, braking your vehicle. And that's why after a few years, you need to bleed your brake lines. In other words, you need to push out any air that might have accidentally gotten into the, the brake lines. That way it's easier to stop your vehicle. Density is defined by mass over volume. That's not the letter P on the left, it's actually the Greek letter rho. And uh, density is always measured in either grams per cubic centimeter or in kilograms per cubic meter. And every substance out there, they have a different density. It's not to say that it's impossible for two to coincide, but they'll have a unique value based upon their temperature. If you look at the fine print at the bottom, you'll see that all these values are based upon a temperature of zero degrees Celsius. Uh, after all, if you increase the temperature, the molecules will jiggle a lot faster, causing the molecules to spread further out. And if the molecules spread further out, they take up more volume, so the density will decrease. If two substances so happen to share the same density, you'll notice that they'll be able to float uh, relative to each other. And that's what you'll see in this drink over here, if you ever had uh, aloe vera, uh, where the aloe vera uh, shares the same density as the liquid water, and that's why it floats or remains suspended inside the liquid. Pressure is defined by force over unit area. It is a scalar quantity, after all pressure acts in all directions. Pressure is measured in pascals in honor of Blaise Pascal. Uh, often we measure it in larger quantities, such as in a thousand pascals, and that's why it's measured in kilopascals. Let's go through this numerical example. Uh, when you're swimming, the pressure acting on the swimmer's hand is roughly 120,000 pascals, and the surface area of the hand is roughly 84 centimeters squared. Now we need to convert that centimeter squared into meter squared when we're solving it. Uh, just keep in mind that, yes, there is 100 centimeters in one meter, however, there are 10,000 centimeters squared in one meter squared, because now it's a two-dimensional uh, measurement. So now you have to multiply 100 centimeters by 100 centimeters to get 10,000 centimeters squared for every one meter squared. Or if you convert from uh, centimeter squared into meter squared, you need to divide by 100 and divide by 100 yet again. And that's why the surface area works out to 8.4 times 10 to the negative 3 meters squared. So keeping that in mind when you go through your calculations, it works out to roughly 1,000 newtons. Here's something to think about. As you ascend, whether if you're climbing a mountain or if you're ascending on an airplane, you'll hear your ears pop. And the reason for that is that there's a difference in air pressure uh, from your outer ear versus your middle ear. And as you ascend, the air pressure decreases because there's less air molecules squishing on top of other air molecules when you're at a higher altitude. Uh, when you open your jawline and you hear that pop, you're actually opening up the eustachian tube that which then balances out the pressure between the middle ear and the outer ear. So we're gonna create a general formula to define pressure as a function of depth. We start off with uh, the pressure formula, knowing that the force acting on any given substance is based upon the force of gravity, so uh, F is equal to mg. And uh, since uh, mass is equal to density times volume, we sub that into the formula, and uh, the next thing is knowing that volume is equal to length times width times height, or surface area times height. Something just to keep in mind that when we create the general formula, we are actually assuming that the density of the fluid remains the same at any altitude. Even though this isn't true in real life, after all, if you think about uh, cheerleaders trying to create uh, a human pyramid, the cheerleader at the bottom suffers the most, and the cheerleader at the top probably has the easiest job. 
So the density does change in real life. However, if we're taking a look at just a general overall observation, especially with uh, fluids such as liquids, uh, the density remains relatively the same at, um, at different uh, depths. So we're going to assume that the density remains the same, so therefore the pressure will change depending upon which, which depth you're at. So the difference in your pressure is equal to your density times the gravitational field strength times your change in height. Or on the AP exam, they write it out this way. Your final pressure is based upon your initial reference pressure plus the density times gravitational field strength, that's what G is, uh, times your change in height. So pressure is more based upon the depth of the fluid versus upon volume. If you take a look at this apparatus over here, you'll notice that uh, all these different uh, flutes have different radii in opening. Uh, but yet, however, if you look at the fluids, they all rise up to the same level. Okay, So really, the size of your opening of your tube doesn't matter. In fact, this is what many builders use, actually, when they're trying to level out a floor. They'll just fill up a tube filled with water, and they don't really care about uh, the radius of opening of that tube. It could be the same, but it doesn't really matter, because as long as they stretch out that tube filled with water to two ends of the room, the water levels will balance out, and that's how you can find out a reference level in any room in the house. And if there is a difference in elevation, when a fluid flows from a higher elevation to a lower elevation, that's known as the pressure head. Let's go through this example over here. As you can see in the picture below, the difference in elevation from the water from the top of the reservoir versus where the faucet is inside the house works out to 30 meters. And we're trying to find out the difference in pressure in the scenario as well as what the pressure head would be. All right. So our delta H works out to 30 meters and the density of water is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Uh, to help you visualize this better, uh, imagine a box where the width is one meter the depth is one meter and the height is one meter. All right, that works out to one cubic meter. And if you fill it up with water, uh, there's a thousand liters of water that will fill up in that space. And a thousand liters of water has a mass of a thousand kilograms. So that's why the density of water is at a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. We go through this mathematical exercise where our final answer will be measured in newtons per meter squared, but uh, the standardized unit we use is measured in pascals instead. All right. So that's roughly 290 uh, kilopascals of pressure difference. Uh, that's the pressure difference that which results in the water spraying out uh, in the faucet in your house. Uh, after all, if the pressure head wasn't the same, then you'll notice that uh, the water won't flow as rapidly. So that's the pressure head. It's the difference in elevation between uh, the top of the water reservoir and uh, where the opening is at the bottom. Um, again, from the previous example, we don't even care how wide the reservoir is or what the volume of the reservoir. As long as the height has a difference of 30 meters, we will have a difference in pressure of 290 kilopascals, and we will experience that uh, rush of water inside the house. So in other words, we can actually have a thin straw. As long as it's stretched up to 30 meters, we'll have the same exact difference in pressure noted at the faucet. Let's talk about the science of straws. Straws, they actually won't work in space, and that has to do with the fact that there's no pressure difference in space. All right, so we actually do have to have that uh, air pressure difference. In fact, if you actually look at it, we are being pressed by roughly three to 500 kilometers of air, and that's what creates the air pressure. And uh, when you suck on a straw, you're actually decreasing the air pressure inside the straw, and thereby forcing the air pressure outside to push against the fluid to force the fluid through the straw. So without a difference in pressure, or without any air molecules, uh, you won't be able to create that partial vacuum to suck food in. And the same thing is also true with regards to uh, how a vacuum cleaner works, where a vacuum cleaner will decrease the air pressure inside its canister, and it's the 300 kilometers of air outside that's pushing uh, against all the debris, drawing it into uh, the reservoir inside your vacuum cleaner. I don't know if you've ever done this before, but uh, next time you go to a restaurant, try filling up a straw with water and then cap the top. And then you can pull the straw out and you'll notice the fluid suspends inside the straw. And it has to do with the fact that the air pressure inside the straw wants to match up with the air pressure outside of the straw. And because they are both in equilibrium, the fluid remains suspended inside the straw. Now there actually is a maximum height of a straw that you can use to draw up liquid. And that number still happens to be 10 meters. You can't draw a liquid higher than 10 meters or 10.32 meters if you really want to calculate it out. And the science behind that is that you're trying to create a perfect vacuum inside the straw. So then the pressure head would be the difference between 
uh, a vacuum versus uh, the air pressure at sea level, which is at 101.3 kilopascals. Knowing the density of water is roughly at 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, the math works out to 10.32 meters. And people have known about this phenomenon for many generations. In fact, what they would notice is that if they try to draw the liquid up on a regular day, uh, it would be roughly at 10.32 meters. Uh, on sunnier days, where the air pressure is higher, the fluid would draw well up to 10.32 meters. And on rainy and cloudy days, where the air pressure is lower, uh, the fluid wouldn't dry up as high, and you wouldn't attain 10.32 attain meters. And that's pretty much the fundamentals behind how a barometer works. Some houses have a reservoir in their backyard to collect all the liquid waste. And the question is, where would the pump be located? Would it be placed inside and submerged inside the, the waste, or would it be placed above? And the correct answer is that it needs to be submerged inside the liquid. Think about it this way. All that brown water, it doesn't contain just water. It contains all human excrements as well. So the density is going to be higher than regular water, making it very difficult for you to uh, suck it out. And that's why the pump needs to be submerged into the brown water so they can push the liquid out as opposed to trying to draw it out using negative air pressure. So the pressure head for mercury will be different than that for the pressure head of water. Uh, for one thing, the density of mercury is roughly 13.5 times greater than the density of water, uh, as you can see in the givens. All right, And as a result, uh, the difference in height for mercury from a vacuum to regular atmospheric air would be much shorter than water. And if you go through the math, it works out to roughly 76 centimeters. So that's why meteorologists would prefer to use um, air pressure measured in millimeters in mercury versus uh, millimeters of H2O. Uh, so that this crazy apparatus can actually fit inside a room. Uh, something just to think about um, is that uh, the air pressure does change on a day-to-day -day basis, and that difference in air pressure can actually be a good indicator of whether it's going to be a sunny day or a rainy day. On a sunny day where the air pressure is much greater, that which prevents water from evaporating, the increased air pressure would then cause uh, the fluid of mercury to rise uh, at 760 millimeters or above. So that's an indication for a nice sunny day. Meanwhile, on a rainy day where the air pressure decreases, so the rate of water evaporation will have a higher tendency of happening, uh, then you have values that will be less than 760 millimeters of mercury. In fact, this is the reference value, and that's why it's often known as uh, one atmospheric air pressure or even 101.3 kilopascals. And this contraption that we just made over here, it's known as a pressure gauge. For more review on this topic, please check out us.archive.org. There's a subsection in there on the topic of AP Physics B on fluids, and it's a great review on fluid mechanics. I'll include a link in the description below, and thanks for watching.